Today, I have to see, is July 26th. It's a Sunday, and it is the day on which we commemorate the passing of Denkyo Shitsu, Kyozan Joshu Daiosho. You might have expected that after my talk yesterday, today would be Shuman Katoshu, uh, case number 25, which would have been very appropriate uh, and fitting, but I decided today not to give a talk that is prepared upon the text of the ancestors, but to speak about something and to reflect about a question that I have asked myself a lot and that I would like to share with you. And the question, well, is how, how did we get here? How did we get here to this place? How did we end up meeting in this format? How did we get involved in all of this? And how did it get here? It is important for me, at least, to acknowledge and to understand what is it or what stands behind all of this and what brought Joshu Roshi to appear here in the United States and also to get away from the way of seeing it from a self-centered point of view because of course, in my life, it, it seemed like that Joshu Roshi appeared as a single kind of outstanding force in my life and in the lives of many of us. And sometimes it took me also time to realize that is that it takes time to learn to appreciate that nobody and no phenomenon in this world, no person, no tradition, no teaching, life itself does not, as Roshi always taught us, nothing arises unconditionally. So what are these conditions that have brought us to this place? to this very breath we are taking at this time. I don't know if you can see this very well, but I'll just hold it here a little bit and let you know what it is. This is a lineage chart. It is the lineage chart that Joshu Roshi had given out that shows his lineage. In the front, we have all the kanji, all the names of everybody who in the tradition of Rinzai Zen, in the Myoshinji Ha, in the Myoshinji lineage came before him. And he was kind enough to have one of his Western students write them out in the back with the names so we can read them. And there's some very, very interesting aspects to this. When we look at the tradition of Zen and of Rinzai Zen, we know that the Chinese Zen school, when it came into existence, established the connection to the historical Buddha through a line of 27 Indian ancestors in India after the historical Buddha. 27 generations on the Indian subcontinent. And the 28th 
person moved from India to China, Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma becoming the first Chinese ancestor. And it is striking that yet again, there were 27 generations of Chinese ancestors. And the 28th transmitted this way of practice to Japan. I, I think you see where this is going. How many generations were there before Joshu Roshi came here? Well, it's 27. Joshu Roshi was in the 81st generation after the historical Buddha as accounted for in this lineage chart. This is one of the aspects that Joshu Roshi did not really expose us to here in America. Uh, having trained after Joshu Roshi's passing in a different branch in a different lineage of the same Myoshinji tradition. I found practices that Joshu Roshi had not transmitted to us out of choice. It was his choice not to bring them into this American Zen practice as we have experienced it at, at Inzaiji and at Mount Bali. But in the other tradition, the Zen studies tradition, every day we chant all these ancestors. In the daily sutra book, we have them both in English and in Japanese. It begins with first the six Buddhas that were there before Shakyamuni. Then the Japanese pronunciation of all the Indian ancestors, ending with Hanyatara Sonja, the first Chinese ancestor, Bodai Dharma Daishi, Eka Daiso Zenji, so san gan chi zen ji, do shin dai zen ji, munin dai man zen ji, in o dai kan zen ji, nan ga koe jo zen ji, basu do itsu zen ji, yaku jo e kai zen ji, o baku kiyon zen ji, rin zai gigen zen ji. And that's where the Rinzai tradition starts. And it goes on through all the names of many, many ancestral teachers who we meet in koans, who we meet in the descriptions, in, in the accounting uh, of the Jinge, Keizan uh, Den Toroku, the description of their lives ending up with Kido Chigo Zenji, the last Chinese ancestor, and jumping over to Japan by the Otokan lineage. O Dai O Kokushi, Dai To Kokushi, Kanzan Egen came to be Nampu Shomyo, Shuho Myocho, and Kanzan Egen, the three of them, O Tokan going all the way up to the last common ancestor. After Hakuin, we have Tore Enji, Kasa Anji To, and then the lineage splits. Currently in the living Rinzai Zen lineage, there are two lines of transmission that split after, after uh, Kasa Anji To. And one is called the Inzan lineage, which Joshu Roshi was a part of. And the other one is called the Kakuju lineage. So at uh, 
大菩薩禅道へです。卓上高専、早産元気を禅寺、加産禅料禅寺、早産元法禅寺、元法義勇禅寺、早炎元寿禅寺、永老スタイ禅寺。And for Joshu Roshi, it's just these last six generations that are just a little different. Inzan Ien Zenji, Taigen Shigen Zenji, Dai Setsu Joen Zenji, Dokuon Joshu Zenji, Ban Ryo Zenzo Zenji, Joten Soko Zenji, Hyozan Joshu Zenji. We had the wonderful fortune, many of us had the wonderful fortune to meet Hyozan Joshu Zenji. And it is striking in the back of the lineage chart to see the number 82 with an empty line next to it. And with Joshu Roshi's departure, this line will remain empty forever. So we got here. This is what's behind Joshu Roshi's coming here. Traditions that go for millennia. And we are left behind with that empty, wide gasping space of 82 and an empty line that is not filled in. I told you yesterday that I happened in the bookshelf to come across Yet something else that I want to show you. This is the Zero Magazine, issue one. And inside it says, printed by Benson Press, La Jolla, California, 1978. And the first part of it is an interview with Joshu Roshi, conducted by Richard Cohen and Eric Lerner, and translated by Haruyo san. And there are many questions in here that in 1978, how many years ago is that? It's a long time ago. But many of these questions still, and not only still, but very acutely point to this very day, to this very moment, to the year 2020, where we find ourselves with the gaping space on line 82. One of the questions is, do Americans and Japanese have the same need for practice? And here it's recorded that Roshi says, said at that time, basically the practice itself is the same, but their way of life is different. So different methods must be adapted. What, of, what sort of different methods was asked by the interviewers? Roshi said, for instance, say, ah, say it. In this noise, we realize ourselves in this, ah. The moment we realize, 
Ah, where does the previous self go? Where did it go? This is Zen Koan. The answer to that koan is the same for Japanese and Americans. The only difference in replies is between one who is still attached to self and someone who has no attachment. The interview goes on. What changes in traditional forms have you made for Americans? The koans that are abstract, distant from life, don't help at all in America. So I use koans that pick up elements from your daily life. Old style Chinese koans make for a lot of misunderstanding amongst Americans. The interview goes on. Do American students have any particular good qualities? Joshu Dorsey. I believe that real Zen mind will take hold in American students and create a new culture. American culture has been dominated by materialism and its religious life by Christianity. This has been difficult to change. But now young people are freer from conventional ideas and becoming rich, famous, or conventionally religious. Until now, the Western world has had no doubt of its concept of self, but now young people don't have that kind of belief. Now there's more focus on the present. What is this self? This was in 1978, 42 years ago. In 2020, we are facing changes in society. We are facing changes in the world. We are facing young people, a new generation, of youth with high ideals, with high aspiration, and the willingness to bring their aspirations into reality, even more so than in 1978. As a society, we realize underlying bias. We realize how racist systems are. But then through exploration of our own self, we find out that, well, the racism really sits in us, in the way how our minds work. Discrimination is built in. How can we live authentically and get over that kind of discrimination where it does not belong? where it is harmful, where it is solely adapted for the unconditional affirmation of our own desires. Do you think there's some Zen mind already in America? Nineteen seventy-eight, Roshi said, I feel it has started. I have reflected on my method of teaching and asked myself, is my teaching really too difficult for Americans? But it's not, because when I travel around, I find maybe one in a hundred who can catch the proper attitude toward the koan. Meeting them convinces me that my teaching is not too difficult. One in a hundred can answer me and catch the exact point of the koan. I can see that these people are highly intelligent, even though their backgrounds in conventional religious ideas are not as good as their intelligent and free minds. So-called religious people are difficult to teach.
what is the importance of the traditional forms of practice for the understanding of what you are teaching? Roshi, everything starts from right posture and right breathing. Everyone can do this. If you start concentrating on something in the mind, you will be caught by thought. If you sit and breathe correctly, then you realize that there is a world other than thinking and that you exist in both worlds. This other world, which she used to call Chokkan no Sekai, the world of intuition. In addition to the posture and breathing, is being asked. Zen practice has a very exacting form. Besides the posture and breathing, how much of it is essential? This is a question we are asking ourselves now. Roshi said, with regard to food, vegetarian is preferable, especially during the training period. But you should not have the idea that eating meat and fish is some kind of sin. If you are attached to the do not idea, it is the same as attachment to doing it. For another example, there is no sex during the training period, 1978. It is important to go through a period of celibacy to understand what it is like. But if you get stuck in it without going further, then that is attachment. The function of true existence includes both sex and no sex. So don't worry. One of the most important questions that I find in this interview is the question, what is the difference between practice and training? Roshi answered, training you do alone. Practice involves two or more persons together in a situation. Thus, you can do practice with your girlfriend. Training emphasizes the process of self-negation. And then with that as a basis, true self can manifest. Practice is applying this to life in society, to daily life in ordinary reality. So is the question. Training must, be, must come before practice. In Japan, after you have trained a while in the monastery, then you are kicked out. You must then go back to society. The world becomes your place to practice. That is just one of the many stages that somebody who trains in the Rinzai tradition as a monk, as a priest, serving the Sangha, goes through. Once somebody receives that so-called seal of approval, Inka Shome, they are kicked out and they have to go back into the world and get, rin get, get rid of that Zen stink get rid of any ideas that they have achieved anything and put their action where their experience from the cushion is. This period is called Shoyo Chotai, the long ripening of the sacred embryo. The long ripening where we have to put into action what we have seen through what we have been able to be immersed in. And then after that, uh, is, there is yet another step uh, where then the official appointment to becoming somebody who holds a spot of actually being able and allowed to teach as a full representative of a lineage comes and that is uh, uh, called Shitsugo, where you receive a specific name that points to the room in which one performs the function of a shike, of 
Roshi, who gives Sun Zen and works with students in a very intense way. Joshu Roshi's name is Shitsugo was Den Kyo Shitsu, transmitting the echo, the echo of the Dharma, pointing to the fact that the Dharma itself needs no transmission. The echo of the Dharma, the transmission of what Roshi taught us through his being, through his training that he gave us, is that transmission of the echo. Yet we have to find the resonance of that dharma that has been demonstrated to us to make it alive and embody it here now. Even though there is the number 82 with a gaping hole over the line. A couple of more things from this wonderful interview. Is it necessary to create institutions in America for the training? Joshu Roshi said, it is not necessary to have special institutions for practice, but a monastery is necessary for training. For practice, any kind of group or organization can furnish the situation a restaurant even. The interviewer continues. In Japan, the, traditions, the tradition is that the monastery is supported by lay people. There is no tradition like that in America. Does Roshi see trying to transplant that tradition here in America or would it have to be done differently? Joshu Roshi. Without outside assistant, assistance, it is very hard to establish a monastery. In Japan, the takuhatsu system, alms rounds by the monks, works, but that would not work well in America. What about Cimarron, your Zen center in downtown LA? How does Roshi understand the function of Cimarron Zen center? what we call Rinzaji Zen Center now. It is a unique combination of training and practice. For one thing, it's open to the public. Outsiders can always come, which makes it difficult for the residents to focus on training, because in training you must forget about yourself, forget about your girlfriend, forget about everything outside, as you do in session. So this is more difficult at a public place like Simran Zen Center. And then in addition to training, you are also living and working together. Roshi, is there some kind of special necessity for this kind of institution in America? Yes, says Joshu Roshi. I prefer not to establish a temple, but a center. Interviewer, what is the specific need? The most important thing is that it belongs to you. A temple belongs to the abbot, but if the center doesn't become yours, then it cannot last. The interviewer asks, in the Zen center, you have people who live here, but go back and forth outside to work, alternating practice and training, which you don't have in the monastery. Is there a specific need for American people to have this situation? Joshu Doshi, without this kind of center, there can be no monastery. Why is that? This is a place for the public. Anyone who follows the Zen tenets can come at certain times to practice. That is not what a monastery is. Monastic training means you do not come and go so readily. Beginners cannot start that way. So we need a center for people to learn until they are ready for training. Zen is so new here. In Japan, people have at least a vague idea of what Zen practice is. 
here no one knows at all before they actually begin. And if only the monastery is available, they will never begin. So the Zen center in the city is like a showcase. People can see it and try it. And then after that, they can decide to try the training. Question, does it also work the other way? If you were at the monastery for a time, then the natural thing is to come to a Zen center. Roshi again, that's a very necessary process. It's like a step in that Shoyo Totai, a step where you take from the cushion in the training, you take it into practice with society. It's not a lifetime institution, Roshi says. It's very different from a Catholic monastery. So, long pauses then in this interview. And Roshi talks about Muga, the practice of self-negation. One of the last great visitors who we had and teachers, Noritake Shunan, or Dongishitsu Urodaishi, spoke about Muga and the practice being Muga, no self, self-negation. And self-negation is described here, or she says, as I have said before, the practice of self-negation and the manifestation of true self is one of the most important tenets of Zen. And he goes into rules and offices. And I also want to read that to you because it will inform my own expression after this. What about the organization of the offices? It is according to the situation. If you have 100 people at the monastery, you need seven officers. But if you have 20, you only need three. Question, could you have a situation without officers? A democratic system. It can be possible to have no offices where everyone is equal and all students take on responsibility. That is the real old way because the teacher, the Roshi, is really the center of the practice. So as long as the Roshi is there, offices are not necessary. But on the other hand, if there are many people and only one Roshi, how can they communicate with him? So that is the beginning of the necessity for officers. The interviewer. Americans are not used to so much authority as they find in a Zen monastery. Does Roshi think it is helpful for the practice of no self to have this experience of so many rules and officers? Roshi laughs. In America, there is not much opportunity to practice the use of authority. Once a student is given authority, he uses it as if there were no limits. Everyone wants to show off their own power. Americans are terrible that way. That's the trouble. The ones with the power enjoy using it too much and the rest don't like to be told what to do. It is really the responsibility of the officer who is given the power to keep people happy, to keep them from being hungry and to have better zazen. They must think of that. They are servants for others. Roshi, can you say something about the form that Zen Buddhism will take in America in the future? Joshu Roshi. I expect a very wise man will come along and establish Zen culture in America. I'm quite interested in this since I do not want to stick to the old tradition. I want to create something new, but since my English is not good, I cannot get a good sense of America. Your questions are very interesting. It takes time for me to understand them. Where do these questions come from? I'm thinking about your psychological and mental activity behind the question. 
the interviewer feels compelled to answer this question, where do the questions come from? And says, I think much of the questioning comes from my experience this past winter at the monastic center on Mount Bali, where the practice is very simple and very pure. There's lots of snow around, and you don't even know that downtown LA is an hour and a half away. Then suddenly winter's over, and here we are out in the world, and there's no apparent place for that practice. So the questions are concerned with how to establish a place outside the mountain for the practice to grow. Goshi ends the interview with the following. When you exhale, you must exhale all of Mount Bali. When you inhale, you must inhale all of this world. If you think about combining the two, that is misleading. Instead, you have to realize that there are two separate lives. It is wrong to set up the self and try to adjust the outside world to it. Instead, give the self to both worlds, which are real and necessary. At one time, you must leave your girlfriend and life alone. At the other time, you must be with her. To be alone and to be together, these can be freely repeated. That is real life. To go to the toilet is done by the self, and to eat food is also done by the self. Americans think, which is the real self? To go to the toilet or to eat? You are doing both. These questions and this interview is striking at this time. One reason is that gap next to the number 82. One reason is the question that we have been six years without Loshi's physical presence. He had stopped teaching a few years before that. And just now after this time of extended mourning, things begin to stir. Parts of the Sangha, parts of the disciples are starting to wake up. And we all have to ask ourselves, what is it that we can do to bring forward this teaching that has been imparted on us within what we can do? And one of the first steps that we need to really attend to is to look at the world and see how much and how deeply this practice is needed, how deeply it is needed by this newest of all generations who are fully engaged in realizing their ideas and making them real, of making this a more just society, a society where your sexual orientation or your gender identity does not matter, a society in which the color of your skin really is nothing but an attribute that is not to be judged, held against you, or would entitle you to different treatment. And we have to realize that to achieve that in the world, as we heard in this interview, in Joshua Roshi's own words, this underlying training, enabling this generation to have that peace of heart and to find that home that allows them to go out and fight 
and demonstrate and change to give them the practice that allows them to find that fire, to discover it in themselves and to have the energy to not just talk about it. That also means if we look at the strife in the world, our own little quarrels that we have between each other in the Sangha must be overcome. Resentments, assumptions of rank or status, Roshi spoke about the need to have hierarchy as a function and the need of having equality as a principle at the same time. I was fortunate enough after Joshua Roshi's passing to continue in a different lineage here, but to really, by doing that, learning to appreciate the enormous wealth of what has been imparted on us. And really by not being home anymore with one spiritual parent to realize how strong that connection of heart is to this day. And then to overcome the idea, this is not about me. This is not about you. In this hierarchical form of Rin Zai Zen, we have to become the shapeshifters who function and manifest the function of whatever role we are assigned. If we are Jiki Jitsu, we become the Jiki Jitsu in the monastic context or the formal context, we address each other as Jikijitsu-san. No matter, even if there's a monk's name behind it or a nun's name. That's another important point to make. It was wonderful to encounter Rinzai Zen also in a female teacher and learning to change yet another underlying bias. You will, you, you will notice it makes a difference. I spoke about the ancestral lineage, not the patriarchs. There are women that never were named father and mother husband and wife, both are needed in this practice. Both need to be acknowledged. So let's be sure that we get this Sangha, these many, many hundreds of people who were touched in their heart and their being by Enkyo Shitsu Kyozan Joshu Roshi to come together to step over that what irks us, what makes us dislike the past, dislike others, or like what we think we have to say about it, and come together so that practice and training will go forward. And we have to find a way it is very clear from what we just heard from Josu Roshi that Rinzai Zen is a teaching of no self. It's also a teaching that is based upon the principles of not only doing Zazen, but also engaging in koan practice, of having San Zen, and also of having Taisho. If this is to remain Rinzai Zen, we have to find a way forward to overcome that gaping hole on line number 82. 
How it will be solved, we don't know. But one thing I know deeply in my heart, and that is, unless we all come together, as long as we don't get stuck in organizing ourselves in this group or that group for the reason of separation, there's nothing wrong with groups. But let's not use them as yet another identity that will keep us apart. I look at my screen. There are thousands of disciples of Joshua Roshi out there. Today we celebrate for six years now that he has departed and we are less than 20 people. Joshu Roshi's heart is calling out from the transformation. Please do not squander what I have given for 107 years. Let's find a way together to manifest that living Buddhism. to show the resonance of that echo of Dharma that Denkyo Jitsu Joshu has imparted on us. Please come home, please come together. Please step over that little self and let's do training and practice all together for yet generation 82, 83, 84, 85.